Welcome back to another episode of College Town Talk. I'm Jonathan Frank. And I'm Shan Stout. Shan, it's the final week of February and Black History Month, and we're ending the month with two incredible guests who have been uh, not just a part of Black History in Cookville and the Upper Cumberland, but history, period. We are so blessed to get to speak with them today. Now, first off, we're talking to Morris Irby, the first Black baseball player at Tennessee Tech University. Now, he holds a spot in the Tennessee Tech Sports Hall of Fame and the Tech Office of Intercultural Affairs Hall of Distinguished Achievers. He is such a wonderful person. He was also part of the first integrated class of our local schools, and he has served on more volunteer boards than you can count including for my friends over at WCTE. That's right. And later, we're going to be talking with three-time Tennessee Tech alumna Lori Jackson Strode. Many of our listeners will know her as a longtime counselor at Cookville High School, but she's also the 2023 Impact Cookville Honoree of the Year and the vice president of the Cookville Theater Company. And it was in that capacity that she just directed the groundbreaking local production of I Am My Ancestors Wildest Dream, celebrating the struggles and triumphs of black history. And she's gonna tell us all about it. I cannot wait to speak with them both. So let's get right to it. Up first, it's our conversation with Tennessee Tech Sports Hall of Famer and Cookville Trailblazer, Morris Irby. Welcome back, everybody. It is our honor and privilege today to be speaking with a pivotal figure in the history of Tennessee Tech University and the Upper Cumberland. Morris Irby is a Cookville native who, in 1967, became the first black baseball player recruited to Tennessee Tech. But what's incredible about Morris is that at that young age, he had already made history years earlier when his racially segregated school here in Putnam County burned down and he became part of the integration of our local schools in 1963. Morris graduated from Tech in 1971, the first person in his family to attend college and earned a master's degree from Tech in 1977. In 2019, he was inducted into the Tennessee Tech Office of Intercultural Affairs Hall of Distinguished Achievers. His photo still adorns the hallway in the Roden University Center outside the Leona Lusk Officer Black Cultural Center. That same year, he received WCTE's Sheepdog Award for being a guardian of the community, and in 2021, he was named to the 47th class of the Tennessee Tech Sports Hall of Fame. Morris worked for 39 years at Cummins, Inc. before retiring in 2012, but even more impressive is his volunteerism and leadership in the community, including his past service on the Tennessee Tech College of Business Board of Trustees, the Board of Directors for WCTE, the Upper Cumberland Human Resource Agency Board, the Tennessee Rehabilitation Center Board, and the boards of Impact Cookville and the Cookville-Putnam County branch of the NAACP. Morris and his wife, Linda, continue to make their home right here in Cookville. And Morris, we are so grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today. Welcome to College Town Talk. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. Morris, the arc of your life has been truly incredible because you are such a leader in this community, but you started out in a racially segregated school, and that injustice was not rectified until it literally burned to the ground. What do you remember about attending the Darwin School, which I, I know was the name of, of the segregated school for black students here in Putnam County, and then being part of that first integrated class at what I believe was called Central High School, the, the forerunner to, to Cookville High School, were people welcoming? And, and did you have any sense at the time that you were part of something that was truly historic? Jonathan, the first eight years of my school life, again, I attended Darwin. Uh, elementary and high school. It was an, it was the all black school located in West Cookville. And what I remember is we had great times. Uh, we, um, uh, we had great teachers. Um, uh, we, uh, the, the main athletic, um, thing that we had was basketball, uh, boys and girls, but we didn't have, uh, we didn't have other, uh, sports opportunities. But being at Darwin, uh, it was it was great. 
uh, because it, it wasn't only this Cookville community. We had kids that came in from Solana, Livingston, All Good, Sparta, uh, Buffalo Valley, and Silver Point. So what uh, what I can remember is uh, all of those areas being pulled together just because Darwin was the center point uh, for activities uh, for African Americans in the Upper Cumberland uh, area. But we had great times uh, at that time because remember, at that time, that was all we knew. And so, you know, we were just like any other kid, we were going to school, uh, we were having fun with our teammates and so on. Now, in January 1963, our school burned. And we uh, we ended up, we had to finish the school year out in uh, some of the black local churches in the area. The elementary grades went into the Rolling Chapel Presbyterian Church. The junior high grades, seventh and eighth grade, went into Trinity Baptist, and then the high school grades um, nine through twelve went into Wright's Chapel United Methodist Churches here in Cookville. But also understand that time frame from January to May or so, those kids uh, that were being bussed in from the other locations were still being bussed in uh, because the decision uh, had to be made over the summer what was going to happen um, with, the, uh, with the Black uh, students uh, since our school was gone. Uh, but not only that, they was gonna have to uh, understand what was gonna happen with these kids that were coming in from those other locations. Um, uh, so, uh, the decision was made by, I guess, the school board, the county commission that rather than building a new school for the blacks in West Cookville, uh, they would integrate the schools. Um, uh, uh, so that's what happened, but I can remember, uh, walking into central high school, uh, as a freshman and it was kind of like, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, deer in the headlight. Well, uh, you know, you could have put you could have put two or three Darwins inside of Central High School. So, uh, you know, if you can imagine, uh, if you've never traveled anywhere before and you go out into a foreign city or somewhere your first time and you're just looking around, you're scared and not knowing what to expect. Well, that's how we were, uh, because this was a totally different environment. Um, uh, much bigger. They had a lot more things, uh, so it was it was scary. It was scary at first. I mean, we were, there were some students that received us well. There were some that didn't. Uh, I mean, it was nothing to walk down the hall to be called names or to find graffiti on your on your locker. Uh, but it, it it took some time. But there was finally some adjustment uh, that came into place. But uh, again understand this was something totally different for us. Uh, so it, it was scary for a while. Now, Morris, I know that aside from your lovely wife, Linda, baseball has truly been one of the greatest loves of your life. And it has definitely loved you back. Now, it even earned you a spot in the Tennessee Tech Sports Hall of Fame. I want to know what that honor means to you. And maybe can you share with us some of your memories from the moment you found out you would be inducted to uh, that evening at the awards banquet? Being inducted into the Tennessee Tech Sports Hall of Fame, uh, it, it means everything to me. Um, you know, you, you work toward things um, all your life. And then uh, that was a culmination of... Um, uh, of, of something great uh, that that ended up happening uh, for me. Uh, and it was because of the work uh, that I put in. I can still remember um, it, it was it was shortly after after lunch around one o'clock. I was out in town and I got a call on my cell phone. Uh, uh, Mark Wilson, uh, he said, Morris, uh, this is Mark Wilson. Um, and I mean, I knew Mark, but uh, and he said, I was calling you with some news that the um, Hall of Fame committee has uh, selected you um, uh, uh, to be a member of this class. And at first I thought, is this real? Uh, are, are you kidding? Um, uh, and I really, I, at first, I really thought it was kind of someone playing a joke. 
Uh, and then, um, you know, as Mark went on, because I knew Mark, I was actually, I was on the selection committee when they were looking for Mark for the athletic director. And no, he went on and I said, oh, wow. And, and, and then I, I had to take a moment. Um, and, um, uh, you know, again, at that time, a few tears came uh, into my eye, I got choked up. Uh, and I said, so this is real. And he said, I assure you, it is real. Uh, but uh, uh, but that was uh, I mean that that was that was kind of one you know a highlight uh, in your life when you 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 get that call and you realize that your accomplishments are being uh, rewarded. Um, I can remember that night at the banquet. Uh, I had probably I had over twenty family members uh, there with me, uh, my family, my wife's family, and so on, and. Um, uh, one of my baseball coaches was there uh, when I was there, Ron Bargatze. But that evening, I, I mean, I, I can't even begin to tell you, uh, you know, the, the pride that, that, that welled up in me. And uh, I remember even after my acceptance speech, uh, I got a standing ovation. Uh, but it, it was something what people had to realize that was very meaningful for me. Uh, because again, baseball had meant everything for me. It's, it had done so much for me, uh, and then that was that was kind of the, uh, the the cherry on top uh, that made everything worthwhile. It's it's neat to hear you describe that because we had uh, Dr. Diane Murphy on the podcast a few weeks ago <laughs> and Dr. told us also about that moment that she got the phone call from Mark Wilson. Um, and your two uh, reactions and experiences in that phone call are actually pretty similar. Uh, so it's, it's neat to hear that. But Morris, our other guest today is Lori Strode, uh, who I know you know well. We're going to be talking with her about this as well. But uh, we've got to ask you about taking part in the Cookville Theater Company's uh, production of I Am My Ancestor's Wildest Dream. For our listeners who don't know, uh, this was a beautifully performed celebration of Black history featuring an all-Black cast. Uh, I had the chance to, to go and see it. You were fantastic. One of your roles in the production was reciting Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech delivered at the 1963 March on Washington. And you recited the entire speech, which I thought was uh, such an important and interesting choice because many of us know certain excerpts from that speech, little clips from the speech, but to hear it read uh, in its entirety by you, uh, you know, really helped many of us hear that with fresh perspective. So what did participating in that production and specifically reciting that iconic speech from Dr. King mean to you? Yeah, uh, Jonathan, uh, being a part of that production, uh, it really meant, uh, it, it meant everything uh, to me uh, it, it, it actually gave us an opportunity to tell more of our story, to tell more of the Black experience, uh, to help people understand uh, the struggles that we encountered and, and, and really some of the struggles that we continue uh, to encounter. But it also talked to the, the strengths that we uh, as a Black people have and had in enduring and progressing. Uh, so it, it gave me a great deal of pride uh, to participate uh, in that production. Um, also uh, playing um, Martin Luther King and Frederick Douglass. Uh, again, Dr. King had always been someone that I admired. Um, um, he was someone that stood for something, um, uh, purpose, and so on. And I can remember I was a sophomore in college. Uh, when uh, Dr. King was assassinated. And I can remember, uh, uh, I was always fascinated with all the speeches and things that he made. And I can remember ordering an album that had all of his uh, speeches uh, on it. But the one that really uh, grabbed me was the I Have a Dream speech. So I started working on that in college. Just, I mean, just going over it and over it and over it because there's a tremendous message even to this day in that I have a dream speech. Uh, and so um, I, I kind of got a lot of it down. 
um, memorized a lot of it um, because it was meaningful and it is still meaningful today. Now, Morris, I want to talk about the fact that you retired back in 2012. Now, a lot of people would have used that time to take it easy, put your feet up, but you dug even deeper into your involvement in the community. Now, the list of boards, committees, volunteer roles you've undertaken, it is very expansive, including uh, NAACP, WCTE, Impact Cookville, the Tech College of Business, and so many others. Why has it been important to you to continue serving in those ways? And in all your volunteerism and various board assignments, what have you personally found rewarding uh, in all of this work? Well, first of all, Shannon, I, I really feel that it's important uh, to give back. Um, you know, that adage that says, uh, to whom much is given, much is expected. And I, I, I thoroughly believe that. And, you know, I can say that this community uh, has been very good for me. I, I feel like I've been blessed beyond um, means. And, uh, and a lot of that is because of a lot of the participation that I was involved in in a lot of these organizations. You know, what What I, I, I wish people could really understand that, uh, you know, you don't have to look at it uh, like what you're, you're giving, but go into it understanding that you're going to get back as much as you give. And um, a lot of the things that um, uh, a lot of those organizations that I participated in, I can assure you, I got as much uh, from them in my growth as I gave. So uh, it's uh, in, in that sense, it's been, it's been very rewarding uh, to participate in situations and things that has helped me grow as an individual. And I can honestly say that um, participating in these um, in these organizations uh, has thoroughly helped me grow in so many many different um, uh, aspects that I wouldn't trade anything for. It. Morris, uh, our interviews are usually about five questions, but I, I got to slip in one more uh, before we end this conversation. I heard a rumor that you hold a second degree black belt in taekwondo uh is that true and and if if so how did you get into the martial arts <laughs> yeah it, it is true i do have a, a second degree black belt um from uh, jack scott united karate studios uh in 1991 uh i uh, i was kind of um <laughs> uh settling down from all of my sports activities but i knew i needed to do something to stay active and believe it or not, uh, this is how fate works. I had a magazine on my desk at work and I was just flipping through it. I, I flipped over there was a, to a page and there was an advertisement for Jack Scott United Karate Studios. I said, hmm, maybe I'll go take a look at that because I always had a fascination in the martial arts. So I went out, talked to Jack. He encouraged me to take the three day um, um, uh, free course that they offered. I did and never looked back. And so then, in uh, 1995, I tested for my first degree black belt, got that, but then I laid out for about 20 years and I got a call from the studio, said they were starting an executive class. So I went back in 2016 and uh, worked for a couple of more years. And that's when I went and tested for my second degree uh, black belt. But the martial arts, a lot of people think the, uh, it's just about fighting and so on. They don't realize the martial arts is about so much more because it really does. It, it, it teaches you a lot about character, determination. Um, uh, it, it helps you grow in so many ways other than uh, the physical parts of it. That's amazing. And I know that takes a lot of self-control as well. I've, I've had a few friends and they didn't go quite as far as you. I'm very, very yeah. impressed. I know how much yeah. work and dedication that does take. I, and I'm not ever going to make you angry. <laughs> <laughs> now, finally, Morris, this is uh, the end of our interview. So we like to end each podcast with the very same question. So here we go. What is one way that Tennessee Tech has impacted 
your life? Oh, I mean, I mean, Tennessee Tech has impacted my life in so many ways. First of all, Tennessee Tech gave me an opportunity uh, to to play baseball at the Division One level. But most of all, Tennessee Tech gave me an opportunity to gain a tremendous education uh, in business and in psychology. And and I can assure you that had I not had that uh, business degree from Tennessee Tech. My my work experiences wouldn't have occurred uh, as they did. So uh, gaining that quality education from Tennessee Tech basically set a stage for my success uh, in my uh, in my professional life. Uh, because I do know, as I sit here today, that without that degree, I would not have had the roles that I had <clears throat> in um, in in Flea Guard and Cummins. Um, and so it opened a lot of doors for me. Um, a lot of people talk about bleeding orange on the hill. I bleed purple and gold uh, because Tennessee Tech, Tennessee Tech was a lifesaver for me uh, in, in regards to education. And then not only that, it it uh, it played that role in helping shape my my professional uh, lives. Uh, my wife and I, we were at school. At the same time, we dated all through college. And matter of fact, got married at the end. Uh, I graduated in June 71. She graduated in August uh, 71. And we got married at the end of August. So uh, Tennessee Tech, uh, shame on them. They, they put me in a predicament. So, uh, but, but it was a great predicament uh, uh, to have. So I can say 53 years later, um, uh, she still managed to stay with me, so it's been great. Well, you owe a lot to Tennessee Tech. <laughs> Linda is wonderful. Now, Morris, <laughs> I just want to thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. And uh, believe it or not, uh, I have a I have a little bit of uh, empathy because I I grew up in Atlanta and. We, um, I, I literally was shipped across town 45 minutes uh, to an, a nearly uh, all African-American school. So all of my teachers were African-American. Most of my peers were African-American. And my teachers used that as a teaching moment to me. So they were always saying, look, you have a great opportunity for a small amount of empathy because in this environment at school, you are the minority. But Absolutely. in our world, <laughs> we are the minority. And they said, yeah. so when you feel isolated or you feel out of place, remember that when we go out into the world, we are feeling Absolutely. isolated. We are feeling out of place. So I had a very unusual teaching moment as I was being bussed over to a place where I was the minority. And it, you know, for those seven, eight hours in a day, those teachers who were so amazing for me used that to, they said, I want you to be a change maker in our world because you are experiencing something that we know all too well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Well, it's been a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us today and being our guest on College Town Talk. Yeah, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Our next guest is a three-time Tennessee Tech graduate, a longtime Putnam County teacher and counselor, and the 2023 Honoree of the Year for Impact Cookville, along with being the vice president of the Cookville Theater Company, through which she recently directed the groundbreaking local production of I Am My Ancestor's Wildest Dream, honoring the struggles and triumphs of Black history. Now, if you haven't figured it out by now, we're talking about the lovely Lori Jackson Strode. Lori, welcome to College Town Talk. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Honored to be invited. Well, you are obviously a very busy woman. We're so happy you took time to be on the podcast today. But we've got so much we want to ask you, including about your fantastic musical production, which just wrapped up and has received rave reviews. But I want to start out by winding back the clock to when you were a Tennessee Tech student. Now, we all know you today as a major overachiever, but it's hard for me to believe that in your early days as a college student, you claimed there were some tough days where you were on the verge of actually dropping out. 
and someone at the university helped you get back on track. Can you tell us a little bit about that moment and how did that encounter inform the way you approach your work today as a counselor at Cookville High School? Yes, actually, I saw that individual yesterday um, at a program at church. Her name is Libby Phillips and she worked in financial aid. And I remember that day, you know, like it was yesterday. I was very, um, I guess I was going through what you might call a rebellious phase. Um, most kids do that uh, sooner in life. I guess I was a late bloomer in a lot of ways, but um, I did not want to go to Tennessee Tech. It wasn't my first choice. I'm sorry, unpopular opinion on a Tennessee Tech podcast. It turned out well, but at the time, that's not where I wanted to be. Um, I still had a curfew during college. I was just not in a good place. Um, my father was sick. He had cancer. That was another reason that my parents really encouraged me, for lack of a better word, uh, encouraged me to uh, stay home for school. So my response to that was, uh, you know, there were a lot of feelings. I was I was angry. I, I didn't feel heard by them. I, so the way I rebelled or handled that was I didn't go to class. If it rained or I couldn't find a parking spot, I just didn't go. Previously, during all of my previous public school education, um, I've said this before, school loved me and I loved school. I was a good student. I did well. It wasn't difficult for me. It felt safe. It felt natural. So I guess part of my mind thought that that would just continue and I, I could just kind of float through. Well, I couldn't. And I almost flunked out. Um, I was on academic probation. Um, after the first semester, and I didn't do any better the second. Um, and so I lost all my scholarship money, all of the funding. I didn't want to tell my parents this for obvious reasons. You know, I would have gotten in trouble. I didn't want to be a financial burden to them. So I was just going to drop out. I, you know, I worked at Taco Bell. I had worked there for several years at that point, And I was like, I'll manage Taco Bell. I'm done with this. Um, but when I went in that day to find out I don't really know why I went to financial aid for help and not maybe my advisor or something. I can't remember what led me there. Now it was, you know, divine intervention. Um, Libby was working at the front desk that day and I told her the situation. She kind of knew my parents and she was like, come here. You know, and she told me what to write down to try to still quality, still stay in school for one thing. And as qualified for some student loans and things. Um, so I credit that with everything that happened after. She, of course, doesn't. She says, you know, that things would have worked out. But I don't. How would I know that? I don't know that they would or wouldn't because I my plan was to drop out. And she showed me a way to continue my education. And I did. Um, and I graduated and then graduated two more times. It, like I said, all's well that ends well, but that is not how it started. And I share that story often with my students. Um, you ask how it impacted my counseling um, for a couple of reasons. One, with my students who do well academically, I want them to know that college is a whole different world and you cannot rest on your laurels. It doesn't guarantee that you're going to be successful if you don't put in some effort. And then for students who aren't sure of themselves, aren't sure if it's the path, um, I share that with them to say, you know, I overcame some great obstacles of my own doing, um, but if you will just keep stepping and keep moving forward, just keep pushing, keep moving forward, you can get that degree. It is a series of steps, you know, steps in the wrong direction <laughs> or steps in the right direction, but it's a series of steps. So it, it is... Um, it has helped me in helping other students, I think. Well, you talk about helping other students, and you've done that in so many ways and, and a, a number of different capacities. A lot of people know you as a counselor because that's the role you've held uh, at the high school for nearly a decade. But uh, you've also been an adjunct instructor right here at Tennessee Tech. Uh, you previously, I understand, taught math and language arts at the fifth and seventh grade levels. So you've really done it all. Uh, for education majors today at Tennessee Tech, or maybe even those students at Cookville High School who are thinking about pursuing a career uh, in education, what would you want them to know? Um, I want them to know that what you're doing, what you're studying is important. It is important. The pedagogy or method 
is important. Don't think that you're spinning your wheels or not getting where you're what what you need, um, because that is important. The way you teach matters, but the relationships you develop matter as much. So there's an old saying, you've got to reach them to teach them. So you, you don't, I don't know how old that, that saying is, but if you'll create a relationship with them, then your methods can be more effective. So you have to have some idea of how to get that knowledge across to students. And so that's what you're learning while you're at Tennessee Tech. Um, the classroom management courses that you take there is a reason that teaching is a degreed profession. There are actually proven methods. There are theories. There are um, skills that you learn during your time there that you need in your toolbox. You need that when you enter the classroom. So to be able to use that more effectively, try building relationships with those students. And for most education majors, that piece is going to come naturally. But Tennessee Tech is one of the best schools to to prepare their students to be effective educators. So I, I will. Everything turned out for the best. This I didn't want to say, but my, I guess mother knows best. And so, yes, there, mama said it. Um, <laughs> I appreciate your vulnerability here. It's a big deal to say, you know, it's one thing to say your accolades, the fact that you have you know, th three times the degrees of the average person, you know, all these wonderful things, but to get vulnerable and say, you know, because my daughter shares a similar story and we struggled, you know, her freshman year, she was a straight A student. She thought college is going to be aces all the way. It's not going to be a problem. And she felt very isolated, very estranged because it was a very unique environment to her. She'd never been in that college atmosphere. She was from a small town and it was very hard to get A's. I mean, she was like, oh my goodness, some of these classes, I may fail. And mm -hmm. it really was a bucket of ice water on her. I would have loved to have had you as a resource for her to say, you know, look, yeah. You know, for someone to say not only, well, I did this and I did that, but you're actually saying, I've been in your shoes. I know where oh, you yeah. are. And here's how we're going to help you overcome that. Because sometimes you just feel very alone in your failures. Right. And, you know, and, and the, it's only going to be a failure if you quit. Mm -hmm. You know, that's your failure. But as long as you keep moving forward, you know, a failure is not a real thing. It's a perceived thing. But if you're moving forward and I love your message. And I hope for any students that maybe are listening to this podcast, they can say, oh, my goodness, you know, she she felt just like me. And look, she's graduated over and over. You know, you are the poster child of success <laughs> for someone who wanted to quit in school. I mean, like, you know, that that really is a powerful message on your side. And thank you for being willing to share it. A lot of people would be like, well, I'm not going to tell anybody that that's actually just such a useful thing for, for students and just for, for people in general to know that you just, you're an overcomer and, and that's my favorite. But now, okay, I've been holding <laughs> it in all this time, Lori. I can't wait any longer. I want to ask you about your production. I am my ancestor's wildest dream. First off, the concept is phenomenal because just the title alone is impactful. This was a beautiful celebration of Black history, of course, that you not only directed, but also helped create it. You know, creating something from nothing was such a powerful image in your mind and a message just right out of the gate. Um, it's historic in and of itself. So when the show debuted last year, let's talk about it had the first all black cast in a local community theater production since the 1970s. So that was historic in its own right. And then the show was so successful. You brought it back bigger and better this year. What has that experience meant to you? And what did you want your audience to see and take away from the production? Well, hope and joy and pride were the overarching themes that we wanted the audience to take away. But from its inception, it's it's been a labor of love and it has been a, a collaboration with Kathleen Gilpatrick. She's the president of Cookville Theater um, Company. It it would not have come to pass without her. It just it wouldn't, it was she approached me about it. And there are two people that 
I typically don't say no to. There may be more, but there are two that across the board. Miss Johnny Wheeler, if she calls, needs something, I, I don't say no to Miss Johnny. Um, and Kathleen Gilpatrick, they're just, they are forces of nature. They are powerhouse women. They get things done and you just want to be in their orbit. And if they call on you, then you, you answer that call. So Kathy felt drawn to do something, um, you know, just with the way things kind of feel currently, you know, it feels like perhaps there's an attack on teaching, learning certain portions of history. Um, and I always argue that I want to work our way out of a Black History Month because I want us all as Americans to realize that Black history is American history. They're not separate. It's not a little fun little chapter or not fun little chapter. It is, it's in the fabric of, of the quilt of America. It is not a patch in the quilt. It's a part of the fabric. So we want to make sure that we are telling that st story. The arts answer the call many times when we're in a, a place of social unrest or sad times, art answers the call. So when, when Kathleen, you know, contacted me about wanting to do something, I, I said, I would be glad to, but Black History Month always feels very heavy to me because it's the images of the, the hoses, the dogs, the lynchings, the slavery, the Jim Crow, all of it, those, that imagery, um, I internalize things like that. I don't watch scary movies. I don't because I can't, I internalize it. So Black History Month really has historically been a very heavy time for me because it makes me so sad. And I ask people to, especially people in the majority population, to look at those images and flip it. What if since your birth, you've seen those images and it's people who look like you, people who look like your family, your aunts, your uncles, it, it's hard. It, it, it becomes a part of who you are. So if we were going to do something about Black History Month, it had to be celebratory because through all of that, through slavery, through Jim Crow, through the civil rights movement, there was joy. People were living their lives. They were living their lives. They were trying to figure out what they were going to eat for dinner. They were creating art, creating music, creating poetry. They were loving each other or else none of us were, would be here. So I wanted the story to tell that, the perseverance, the joy. Um, it, it had to reflect that. And I had a t-shirt that had come up on an Instagram ad that I had purchased. And it said, I am my ancestor's wildest dream. And man, that just struck me. I try not to impulse buy too much from, from those Instagram ads, but I had to have it because, oh my gosh, I am. You know, my parents both went to segregated schools. My dad did not graduate high school. He went, he was drafted. He fought in Vietnam um, for a country that at the time he just barely was able to sit where he wanted on a bus or not go to color day at the fair. So even my very close ancestors, my parents, I had opportunities that they didn't. I never swam in a segregated pool. I never went to a segregated school. And again, Parkview Elementary, those folks loved me and I loved them. That's why I, who, I, who I am today. I remember when I decided to become a teacher, um, Carol Rink's third grade classroom was the highlight of my life at the time. But to say all of that, even my parents couldn't have dreamed of that didn't even think that they should. They, you know, that not that they should or shouldn't. It just was the situation where they were. Now, as things were changing, my mom was very, um, my mom was very strong-willed. She uh, integrated a nursing school in Murfreesboro. She was the first Black um, nurse at Plateau Mental Health. So she did have those dreams and she had that determination but even as far as they went, things were much easier for me. So back to the why and what we want people to take away, just the joy and the pride and the perseverance and the fact that 
whatever's going on today, um, we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. We do have a voice that they didn't have. So I don't want us to take that for granted, granted and I want us to use that voice. And I, I want us to use it for good. Well, I, I just want to say, Lori, having had the chance to to see the production, I, all of those goals that you say you had for it, I think they uh, were achieved and they they came through. It was it was beautifully done. And we should tell people that you were um, not just the director and a creator, but in the in the cast. Uh, so you you were in it. We're, we uh, interviewed Morris Irby, who was part of the production. Um, just, just an incredibly talented cast. And I've, uh, b- before we move on, I, there was, there was another name I wrote down because I thought we need to talk to them on this podcast. I need to, I need to learn about this person because we're going to see her, uh, like in Hollywood or Broadway, but Regina Pullen was so, I mean, her, the, the singing, her voice, uh, just the level of talent, um, was incredible. It makes you feel proud as a, you know, as a, as a resident, you know, of Cookville that we have that kind of talent in, in Cookville and in the upper Cumberland. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. So Regina, I have known since she was a little bitty girl, um, she used to sing in church at five and that same passion that you saw and the way her presence and the way she delivers a song, I'm telling you, she was born doing that. Um, I, I tease her all the time that she was the first five-year-old I knew with burdens because she would sing so soulfully <laughs> at that level in front of the church about her burdens and about you know how the Lord <laughs> took her burdens. So yes, and Regina is, she actually is a professional artist and she um, is retired from the Air Force. So and that was her job. She uh, was in Tops in Blue. Uh, that was a, a big part of what she did when she was um, in the Air Force. So her willingness to participate in community theater, which um, I don't know if people know or don't know, but you don't get compensated. The talent that we have did that voluntarily. They joined us. They came to the rehearsals. They go for the fittings. They are there every night um, voluntarily because they they believe in the message. They believe in the production. It's it is uh, it's amazing the talent and the willingness to use that talent um, to bring the uh, productions like this to our community that we have here. We're very blessed. Another person that I want to mention who is new, brand new <laughs> to the area um, is Jennifer Gallegos. And she really jumped in with directorial duties. Um, She's got a musical theater background. She graduated from AMDA. She's from, she's lived in Oregon where she's done theater. She was in, I believe, um, Nicaragua where she uh, directed theater there. And she's just moved to Cookville with her family and connected with Kathleen on like, I, I don't even know, like a, it wasn't hip Cookville, but it was something like that, that she was looking for theater people she wanted to join and Kathleen like message her or something like that. And man, she brought that spark. She made it flow more like a, a musical. And in fact, um, we were in a meeting one night talking about what we need to do, what we needed to take out and things like that. And I think she said, that is eight minutes of speaking with no music. And Kathleen and Sam Rafer were like, ah, oh, spoken like a musical theater person. You can have a whole play like with, with no music. But but it was just it was a funny little exchange. But yeah, she she um really breathed new life into it. And I'm so thankful that, you know, she came our way and was part of the process. I have so little to do with this so little. There are so many other people who have poured into this uh, project um, and just made it, made it something beautiful. That's yeah. what a true leader says, Lori. We're, I'm sorry, <laughs> we're still so impressed with you. There's nothing you can say that is going to make us feel <laughs> any less about how amazing you are. Thank you. Thank you for that. Like Shan said in her last question, Lori, you know, you, you've not just been helping to educate us all about Black history. You're really living it yourself with uh, the success of I Am My Ancestors Wildest Dream, 
uh, having the first all black cast in 50 some odd years here in Cookville. But you were also one of just two honorees at last year's Impact Cookville Banquet. And for our listeners who don't know, Impact is a major nonprofit organization in our area founded by Tennessee Tech's very own Dr. Rob Owens that is dedicated to uplifting the African American community here in Cookville. And I had the chance to attend that event last year. I still remember your acceptance speech. Uh, there was a lot of admiration and respect for you in that room, and it it wasn't hard to see why. What was what was that moment like for you? Well, it's a little bit surreal because it, in essence, to me, um, it's not called this, but it feels like some type of like lifetime achievement award that you get at the end of some long, you know, stint in a career or somewhere. And so then you're like, oh, well, last year I was like, well, I'm. 28 years in. So perhaps it is time, but it doesn't feel like time, but oh my goodness. And again, nothing that I don't feel like that I do anything that someone else couldn't do. Like, I don't feel like it's anything necessarily special. I try to offer help. If it's an area that I can help, I try to be a connection between people. If I know someone has this need and I know someone that could possibly feel that, um, I try to be a connection, but I, I was humbled because again, uh, there are so many, you know, you're with so many people who have broken down barriers and, and been the first at so many things. And I'm the first as well, but it's a different kind of first, like just because I'm the first black school counselor here doesn't mean I face the same struggles as my mom being the first nurse at Plateau Mental Health Center at G-Score or the first black student at the school that she went to. So it's a different kind of thing. So it's it's very humbling to think that someone recognizes you as doing something special enough to get an award of that stature. So it was humbling. I'm appreciative. I love all those guys. Um, I remember when Dr. Rob, but Rob and Dana were first, first met each other. Cause we were at tech. I'm a little older than them, but we were at tech around the same time. And um, so I remember them when they were just first making googly eyes at each other and they still do, they still make those same little googly eyes at each other. So they, they'll get me for that later. But um, yeah, it was, it was humbling. I was appreciative. And again, a moment where I could hope that I made all those who came before me proud. I, I do. I am cognizant of that. I really related with the with the movie Mulan because I do think it's important to bring honor to your family name. I do. I, I, I know that that's cultural, um, that, that the movie touched on that culture, but it, it also sparked something in me. I do feel like that's that's important because people pour into you. Your community pours into you. Your parents, your family, they pour into you. You ought to give back by honoring that and recognizing that, I think. Well, I don't think you have anything to worry about. I'm sure that you have placed a great deal of honor on your family's name. (laughs) And Lori, we appreciate you being here today on our podcast, but it's almost the end. And that means it's time for us to ask the same question that we do every single time. And given the fact that you have three degrees from Tennessee Tech, I know it might be tricky to narrow down your answer to this question, but what is one way that Tennessee Tech has impacted your life? My life wouldn't be the same without Tennessee Tech. It absolutely would not. But from my very earliest memories, I went to a preschool and it was called Kitty College. I can remember my mom dropping me off and leaving me. She was like, no, you're at Kitty College right now. But later on, you're going to be at Tennessee Tech and that's real college. So honestly, circling back around, I was never going to get to go anywhere else. I don't know why I thought that they were going to let me leave. They were never going to let me leave. She had planned that since I was four. Um, I remember hearing the chimes when I was little, if we were close enough in town. So it is um, deeply ingrained in me, Tennessee Tech, the campus, the culture, um, the opportunity that it provided with Cookville being a college town. So, and I, again, even though I had a curfew while I was in college because I lived at home and that's just who they were, (laughs) I 
I wouldn't trade it. I, I wouldn't trade it. Um, given given the opportunity to go back and make a different choice, this was absolutely the right choice. And I wouldn't be the person that I am without Tennessee Tech University. Lori, thank you so much for being our guest today on College Town Talk. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. What a way to end the month. We want to thank Morris Irby and Lori Jackson Strode for being our guests today on College Town Talk. We absolutely do. And we want to say this. Black History Month may be coming to a close, but our commitment to hearing from diverse voices and spotlighting these guests from all walks of life here in Tennessee's college town is not. One of the ways you can keep up with Tennessee Tech's work on these topics is to connect with the Office of Intercultural Affairs at tntech.edu slash intercultural. Join us again next week for more conversations with the people who make Cookville Tennessee's college town. College Town Talk is presented by Tennessee Tech University in partnership with the Cookville Putnam County Visitors Bureau. Your hosts are Jonathan Frank and Shan Stout, and original music is performed by Andrew Buckner. Visit us online at tntech.edu slash collegetowntalk.